My name is Alex Rosa, and I'm our lead pastor here at New Life, and I just wanted to welcome you to service with us today. This is your first time, whether watching online or being here in person. Thank you so much for deciding to invest some of your day with us. If you've been here twice or how many times you've watched online, thank you so much for, for being with us, continuing to be with us. Today, we are concluding our series called Mobilize. And in this series, we've been focusing on two things. The first thing is God's passionate love for people. He loves his creation so much, and he told us that we are created in his image, that he sent Jesus to die and to rise again so that we could have a relationship with God. So we could come to know him as Lord and Savior. The second thing that we're focusing on during this series is God's desire for us to join him in his pursuit and his mission for those who don't yet know him as Lord and Savior. And this pursuit of the lost is something that has always been foundational to New Life. Our founding pastor often said that New Life wants to make it hard for anyone in this area to end up in hell. We want to make sure that we are sharing, growing, and living the new life of Jesus Christ with the world one person at a time in such a way that others will come to know Jesus, they, that people will see Jesus through us, that it'll be difficult to end up in hell because of so many people sharing the goodness of Jesus and his glory is just all around. This is something that Jesus talked all about when he was on this earth. He made sure that people knew that he loves the lost, that he came to find those who are far away and to come back. All of God's word depicts this love from God. And Paul, the apostle who met Jesus after Jesus ascended to heaven to be with his father, went around to the early first century area and, and went and started churches and told the lost about Jesus. And in one of his writings, and specifically to the church in Rome, he detailed God's love for us. He said this in Romans 5, 10 through 11, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. While we were enemies, he pursued us. While we were in defiance of him, he died for us. And so we can have this joy knowing that once we come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, we come into his family and become his children. If you're here today and you don't yet know Jesus, I want you to know that God loves you so much that he's been pursuing you and he wants nothing more than for you to enter into this relationship with him. And I pray that that will happen today. After we come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, he then invites us to join him in his work, in the Father's work, which is telling people about him. Paul, later on in that letter to the church in Rome, talked about that. He said, but how can they, and they meeting people that don't yet know Jesus, call on him, meaning Jesus, to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Paul, in that first part, is just talking about some logic. How will people know if no one tells them? So we have a role to play to go and share this good news. The second thing he spoke about is an allusion to what would happen back in biblical times when there was a war going on. You can imagine there was a war that the people would, would leave the city and go and fight this battle, but there would be those who were left in the city and they would be longing for some news of what was happening. There was no radio or social media or TV. So they didn't have an immediate update on how the war was going. So they would just wait and wait and pray that their loved ones would someday come back and that an enemy army wouldn't come after the enemy was victorious and take them all into slavery or to, to take down the walls and to decimate their city. So they would wait. If that battle was victorious, what would happen is that they would tag someone, some poor soul, to then go immediately from fighting to run as fast as they can to the city to bring this news that there was victory. So again, we can kind of put ourselves in their shoes of the people in the city as they waited and waited. And then finally, you see someone running towards you and you know that that was the the image of victory, that someone was coming to bring this good news and you could finally exhale. Paul was talking about that because that's the role that we play. 
Jesus has gained victory over sin and death. There has been victory in the spiritual realm. And we now get to go from that victory because it is already Jesus' victory. And we get to go tell people the fact that there is an opportunity to come to him, to know him as Lord and Savior, that the bondage has been broken, that there is a way to live with God forever. And so we get to be the messengers of that good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring Good news. You can imagine that the feet of the messengers weren't probably actually that physically beautiful once they arrived. After fighting and then running that length, there's probably blisters and there's probably some blood in there, but the beauty comes from the news and we get to share that too. But it won't always be easy to share this good news. It isn't, wasn't probably easy for that messenger to run. And so because of the difficulties sometimes that we face, what we want to do during this series is talk about three steps, three steps that help us to share this victorious good news. And they come from an author named Gary Poole, who wrote this book called The Three Habits of Contagious Christians. And in that book, he spoke about three steps. Now, if you get that book, you'll notice that they're not worded the same. Over the years, he's added alliteration, kind of cleaned it up. But these are the steps we're focusing on. The first one is develop relationships. The second one is discover stories. And the third one is discern next steps. So two weeks ago, we focused on that first one, developing relationships. And what we said about that was this, sharing our lives with the lost will show them Jesus. Over time, through relationships that are real relationships where we honestly care for people the way that Jesus cares for us, people will see Jesus in us and they will get the opportunity to make a decision whether they want to follow Jesus or not. It's still a decision they must make, but through a life of, of loving people the way that Jesus loves us, others will see him through us. Now, if you're wondering, well, what do I do if I don't know anyone that is not a believer in Jesus and you are a believer in Jesus? Well, then the thing that we must do is ask God to bring people into our lives and then actively seek others who don't yet know Jesus so we can share this good news. The world needs to hear this good news. Last week, what we did was we focused on that second step, which is discovering stories, which is two things. One, you're listening to stories, and the second one, being willing to share the story. And we said, God presents windows of opportunity for us to share the good news of Jesus with those in our lives. So once again, it means that we must have people in our lives that don't yet know Jesus. And then we listen, we hear their stories because we care for them. But then we wait for these windows that God will open of opportunity for us to share the good news, this victorious news. And oftentimes when that happens, we can share the story of what God has done in our lives. And last week we went through practically how to write that story. We call it a testimony. What did Jesus do in your life once you know him as Lord and Savior? And we all have a powerful story to tell. And if you missed either of those messages, I'd encourage you to go and watch them on our website or the app. But today we're going to focus on discerning next steps. And this is where we go to God and say, what do I do next? You develop the relationship, you discover the story, but now we are asking God to lead us and help us to be intertwined with his plan for pursuit in the lives of people around us. And so in order to do that, we must be willing to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Paul, in speaking to the church in Galatia, talked about this. He said, for the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out, beware of destroying one another. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Amen. That the Holy Spirit wants to, to guide us and is willing to help us out. So the, the key to this is what Paul was saying is loving our neighbor. And to truly love our neighbor as ourself, we must allow God to lead us. Because left to our own sinful devices, we're going to turn inward. We're going to be selfish. We're going to move ourselves away from the, the difficulty that it is sharing the good news. But with the Holy Spirit, we'll be able to enter into those situations with love. And this leads us to our take-home point. The one point that this message is all about today, and it comes right from God's word. And it's one that I pray that we will take and we'll live it out, not just in the week ahead, but through our lives as we live on mission with God everywhere we live, work, learn, and play. And this is our take-home point. The Holy Spirit helps us share the good news of Jesus' victory. He wants to help us. 
He wants to guide us and direct us. And so let us allow the Holy Spirit to have reign over our lives so we can hear what he wants to say. And it is possible to hear what he's saying. Recently, I listened to a podcast and a guy named John Mark Comer was on it. And I really like John Mark Comer. He was a pastor. Now he's a full-time author. He wrote a book that I spoke on uh, in the fall called Live No Lies. And John Mark was asked about how do you really intentionally grow closer to a relationship with God? Because it is a process. We can grow with God. And he answered this way. Three things help us grow closer in our relationship with God. And I'm sure there is more, but I I agree with these three. Uh, Contemplative prayer, close Christian relationships, and struggle. Contemplative prayer and close Christian relationships and struggle help us to grow closer to God. And again, sometimes it can be a temptation when someone says that we can hear from God or someone maybe tells you they heard a word from the Lord that you go, I don't know. Like, I don't know, you maybe have your skeptical uh, thoughts with you. and You're like, I don't know if that is true. But here's the thing. Jesus said that we would be able to discern and hear his voice. There are some things that we must do when someone says that they heard from the Lord. And we're going to get into some of those things to test it out and make sure that it is really from God. But let us just be reminded by Jesus that we can hear the God of the universe's voice. In John 10, 3 through 4, Jesus is saying this, and he's talking about himself as a gatekeeper and the gate, and us as the sheep. It says, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. Right now, would you please pray with me as we ask God to speak to us today? Dear God, I pray right now that you would speak to us, that you would open our hearts to hear what you have to say. You said that we'll be able to understand your voice. You are our shepherd. God, I pray that we will be able to hear your voice and discern what you're saying today and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When we enter into contemplative prayer, the first thing John Mark Comer talked about, what we're doing is really we're getting everything out of the way and we're sitting and just, or standing or whatever you're doing, kneeling, and we're just focusing on everything that God is, everything that he is. We just give everything that we are up and say, God, just you reign supreme right now. It might sound similar to a practice that people have today called meditation, but it's different in this huge, significant way. And meditation, as the world defines it right now, is focusing on yourself, maybe emptying yourself or whatever. It's focusing on you. But in contemplative prayer, we're focusing on God. In Psalm 1, it talks about how we can meditate on the truths and the words of God, and we are to do that. So in contemplative prayer, we we focus on him and we allow him to lead, to guide, to just be with us, to speak his truth, whatever he wants to do. And we avail ourselves to listen to the God of the universe. And I got to tell you that whenever practicing this, I generally experience one of three things. The first thing that sometimes happens is just a feeling that God is there. It's just like maybe sometimes a warmth or maybe a tingly feeling, but it's just this knowledge that I am not alone, that there is someone else with me, that it's the God of the universe that is present with me in that moment. The second thing that sometimes happens during that time is nothing which I don't know why that is all the time. Sometimes I believe it's a sin in my life that I need to get rid of. And sometimes God's maybe teaching me more patience or something. I don't know, but sometimes I don't feel anything. And then the third thing that sometimes happens is that God will speak, that God will say something to us. And sometimes in a very still, small voice and sometimes in a louder voice, but he'll talk to our hearts or he'll bring something up into our mind or he'll directly enter into just our realm and just say something that is from the God of the universe. A couple of weeks ago, I was in a prayer time before my first Sunday as lead pastor. And I was a little nervous that morning and I was praying about that. And I said, God, just let your ordinary son do something uh, bigger today that, that I can't do on my own. And I, I heard God break through and say, you are my extraordinary son. And I got to tell you, my self-deprecating thoughts really took over in that moment. I thought, ah, it's probably not from God. That's probably just something that like came up in my head, but that's not from God. I'm just a normal, ordinary, whatever. And I continued to go through my morning. And then God brought his words up into my heart, brought his words that say, we are his masterpiece, that he made us. We are in his image. We are created in his image. And then once we come to know him as Lord and Savior, we become his children 
heirs to him and his kingdom. We get to participate with the God of the universe every day. So he's bringing these things. And that's one of the ways that we can test if it truly is a word from God. If someone ever says that they heard from God, but they contradict God's word, they're not hearing from God because God never contradicts himself. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so whenever someone says something that comes from God, we can look in God's word and say, does this align with who God is? And so I, that God did that for me. He started to bring up his words. And then the second thing we can do to test to see if it's a word from the Lord is we can go to wise Christian counsel. So I was in the office the next day and I was talking to Pastor Barry and I just said, I, I think God might've said something to me. And I shared that and he sat and thought, and then he said, yeah, that sounds like something God would say. It sounds like your father was telling you that he's pleased with you. And so I got that confirmation from wise counsel, and we can do the same thing. John Mark Comer said the second thing that helps us grow closer in relationship to God is close Christian relationships. He argues that one to five is kind of the sweet spot, whether that's an accountability partner or a small group of people you can get real with, where people can tell you the hard truths and also the encouragement, but there will be people that won't just tell you what you want to hear, but will tell you what God's word says. So that when you're discerning, is this a voice? Is this, is this God speaking to me? Then they can tell you honestly what, what they have experienced. So you hear from God, you look at his word, you go to these close relationships, and that will also help you when we're discerning the next steps. When the Holy Spirit's prompting us to do something, to, to bring someone to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, to guide them to the throne of Jesus. In those moments, we can have wise advice from those close Christian relationships before we head into those conversations. This is similar to what the king, uh, King Solomon spoke about. He's one of the wisest persons to ever live, probably the wisest person outside of Jesus. And he said this, plans succeed through good counsel. Don't go to war without wise advice. And there are spiritual battles going on. So let's not go into them without wise advice. So we can have these relationships that we pour into, that we invest in to help prepare us for whatever God has for us next. And the last thing that John Mark Comer said about growing closer to God is the struggle. And what I found is that when I lean into God during the struggle, there is no greater time that I've heard God's voice. It seems so easy and evident whenever everything else is falling apart because God is always good and he's always constant. So when we go through the struggle, as difficult as it seems, when we lean into God during that time, we'll grow closer with him. And this is what the apostle Paul was talking about in that letter to the church in Rome. He said, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to a disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So during these times of struggle, let's lean into God. It'll help us grow closer to him. Let's also invest in these close Christian relationships and invest time with God in this contemplative prayer where we just give everything we are and just say, hey, God, you just be in, in this place right now and speak to me and he will. And when we do those three things, it'll help us prepare us for what is next. It'll be like the practice before the game or studying before the test. It'll get us ready to answer God's call when he gives it to us. And he will call when we avail ourselves to him because he wants us to join him in his mission and his pursuit for the lost. It's impossible on our own, but it's possible with God because all things are possible with him. In that book, uh, The Three Habits of Contagious Christians, Gary Pohl talked about the story of him interacting with his friend, Jay. He said when they were in high school, uh, Gary started to develop this relationship with Jay and Jay was on the tennis team with them. They were both very competitive, so they grew close very quickly, but it became evident right away that while Gary is passionate about his love for Jesus, Jay wanted nothing to do with God. In fact, he was in an argument state of atheists, and so they fought often. And Jay often brought up these kind of questions to try to make Gary uncomfortable. But Gary had this love for Jay. He knew that God put him in his heart and in his life, and so he continued to develop this relationship. He loved him, even though Jay didn't believe in the same thing. And as they grew closer, Gary got to discover some of Jay's story, and Jay got to hear about Gary's faith. Well, the last day that they were together before they went their separate ways for college, they played tennis, and then they had another little argument about faith, and then they separated. They, they went their own ways, and Gary said that 
After he left Jay that day, he got to a stop sign and he just broke down and he cried out to God. He said, God, please, please keep working in Jay's life. Two years later, Jay gave Gary a call and he said, you won't guess what happened. When I got to college, someone invited me to a small group. There's a Christian small group of theirs. And, and I said, sure, I'll go. But it, Jay told Gary that I thought I'd go and start causing problems by asking all these hard questions and they'll kick me out. They won't like me there. And he said, but I got there and I asked these questions and they had some really good answers that made me start to think about things. And he said, so then I went on kind of a journey to discover what is really out there. And he said, after all of the seeking and and looking for God, I realized that the most rational, logical thing in the universe is that a God exists. And then once he realized that, he realized that this God must be good. He said, I mean, you look at, I mean, we look at our moral compass, we look at the world around us, and it's evident that God must be good. And so Jay figured that out. And then he eventually went back and trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior. So he's calling Gary to let him know that he became a Christian. And he said, it was two years, man, two years in the making. And we know, looking at that story, that it wasn't just two years. That the four years that came before that through high school where Gary invested in this relationship, he developed the relationship and he discovered the story. And then someone else came and discerned the next step, which is sometimes how it works. Sometimes we plant the seed and we'll never see what God's gonna do, but God will not stop working. He won't stop pursuing people. He's an active God and he's a loving God, so he'll continue working even when we don't see. So when we follow what God has told us to do, but we don't see the results right away, we can cling to the hope that God gives us. This is why I focus so much in my life on this verse. It's from 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and it says, so my dear brothers and sisters... Be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. It's never useless. God can use whatever it is that we're doing for his glory, and he's faithful. Years after the phone call from Jay, Gary was a pastor, and someone came into his office. And when he came in, he said, I just got to tell you, I recently trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior, and I decided that I want to leave the business world and become a pastor. And I wanted to tell you that the person who led me to know Jesus as Lord and Savior was your friend from high school, Jay. And Gary got to receive that good news and the reminder that God was still at work, that the work wasn't done, that he was still moving in Jay's life, still to that moment. And I read that and I cried because there's so many times where we put this effort in, we don't know exactly, but we can trust that God is still good and faithful. And it's also another reminder that what happens whenever the Holy Spirit asks us to do something is oftentimes he asks us to make an invitation. You see, the Holy Spirit often leads us to make an invitation to come to an event or to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And there's other things that the Holy Spirit might ask us to do as a next step, but we're just going to focus on those two as we conclude today. The Holy Spirit might ask us to invite someone to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And in those moments, hallelujah, someone wants to come to know Jesus. I want to encourage you, if you're in that spot, maybe your kid has asked you about it, or maybe your neighbor, your coworker, or or a teammate, and, and they say something about come to know Jesus, you can lead them to the throne of God. You can walk them into this relationship. There's no magical words that they must say. Jesus basically just said, come and follow me. And Paul said that we are to call in Jesus as Lord, which means master and God and owner, and then also call in him as savior, which means rescuer from sin and death. And he says, once we do that, we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouths, we will be saved. We'll be joined to Jesus forever. And so when we lead someone during that prayer, we're just asking Jesus to take control of our lives and to rescue us and cleanse us from our sins and make us New. If you want some help with that, I'd encourage you to to focus on the ABCs at the end of the message. They're a guide to help someone trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. But I pray that God will put you in that position because we'll be able to see someone give their life over to Jesus and then um, get to experience the joy that comes with that. Another thing the Holy Spirit might prompt us to do is simply make an invitation to an event. Maybe that's to the fireworks or maybe to the clay shoot or it's a weekend service here or in the galaxy with the kids or maybe to youth group. God might prompt us to make an invitation. And when we do that, we don't know what God's going to do, but he will work. When Jay was invited to that small group, I'm sure that small group leader had no idea what came before that, but he got to participate in God's work and his pursuit of Jay. And we could do the same thing. 
A couple years ago, I was leading a small group on Friday mornings, but my work schedule changed, so I moved it to Tuesdays. And then some of our group could only work on Friday, some of them only could do on Tuesdays. And so we left it up to the group, what, what day do you want to go on Fridays or Tuesdays? And a lot of them were saying Fridays, but one guy called me and he said, hey, I want to do Tuesdays. I said, oh, okay, why is that? It seems like most of the guys have Friday available instead. And he said, well, I got this guy, Justin, who works with me, and he can't come on Friday mornings, but he can come on Tuesday afternoons, and I want him to come to small group. So we ended up splitting the group, and the, which was great. And so some of them were on Fridays, and Derek and I and Ezra and Joel, my two oldest boys, we were there with Justin on Tuesdays. And the group has grown since then, which is wonderful. But Justin continued to come week after week after week. Eventually, Derek actually, along with Rich Kenzie, are, are the leaders of our small group. And you can see that on the, uh, the small group wall out there. But Derek eventually, um, while leading, couldn't make it one day. And so Justin showed up and Justin said, uh, Derek handed me the book and said that I'm leading today. And Justin did an incredible job. It was so cool to see the growth that happened in his life. And he said the small group helped him to learn how to, to grow with God, to, to pray with him and to read his Bible and encourage him to continue to grow. And that all became because Derek, our leader, was the one that said, hey, we got to do Tuesdays because I want my buddy from work to come on it out and come to this small group. So an invitation might help someone's life to be changed forever. So what do we do? Well, one of the things we can do is we can help people feel comfortable when we invite them someplace. We can help them feel welcomed. I know for me, I had a lot of hangups when I was invited to youth groups before I came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I didn't want to feel awkward or out of place. And so we can help people in those situations. The first thing that we can do is we can invite people without pressure. We don't have to say, oh, can you come every single week for the next year? We could say without obligation, just come out, check it out once. See what you think. Come on out and see if you have a good time. The second, time, the second thing you can do is you can come with those you invite. Think about it this way. If you invite someone to go to the movies with you and then don't show up, how awkward would that be? You're like, hey, let's go watch the newest movie and then you're nowhere to be seen and they have to decide, do I watch a movie by myself or do I go home? What do I do? Same thing should hold true to inviting someone to church. Let us meet them here. So maybe come early to make sure that they see you. There was a study done a few years ago that said within the first five to 10 minutes of a first time guest coming to a church, they know whether they want to come back or not, which that generally is before anything up here happens. And so that means it's so important for people to be welcoming, to be greeting people. And that's why we have such a fantastic team that does that. But there's nothing like seeing a friendly face that you know. And so let's be there for when they arrive. The other thing we could practically do is we could actually sometimes pick someone up and bring them with us. So maybe you do invite them to the clay shoot. You could pick them up and drive them with you so that they don't have that awkward feeling of, will I see someone I know right away? When I was in college, I was volunteering at a youth group and I had a friend that lived about an hour away and he was a senior in high school and I got the prompting from the Holy Spirit to take a next step and invite him to youth group. So I called him up, ca I called him up and his name is Colton. And I said, Colton, would you like to come to youth group uh, on Wednesday nights with me? And he said, sure, as long as you give me a ride. And I thought, oh man, like an hour out, an hour back, an hour out, an hour back, four hours of driving for you to come to, to youth group with me. I thought I was kind of waffling on that, but here's the thing. God sometimes calls us to sacrifice in order to, to help people to know him. I mean, he did it for us. He died on the cross for you and me. What is driving for hours? He actually, during the Sermon on the Mount, talked about this. He said in Matthew 5, 41 through 42, if a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. There was this law back then that said if a soldier saw you and they wanted you to carry their gear for a mile, they could demand you and you had to listen. So they would give you the gear and you'd walk a mile. What Jesus said is take it a step further, go to go the extra mile. And what he was saying is that when we do that, we show the abundant love that God has for us because he went over the, of what he had to do. He did not need to die on the cross for us, but he did it because he loves us. And so he asks us sometimes to sacrifice to help people not just feel welcome, but to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so I said yes to my buddy Colton. So every week I drove out an hour to pick him up. And then usually, thankfully, he would compensate me. Unfortunately, it wasn't with money. It was with a big gulp. And uh, that was kind of nice, though. He got some caffeine as you drove. And, and so we would drive, and, and I would drive him home afterwards. And we'd have this great time getting to know each other. Now, we were 
friends beforehand, but we really got to develop a relationship during this drive. I got to hear his story and I got to hear his past and a lot of the brokenness that was going on with him. And then we grew so, we grew so close that he even invited me one time to his family reunion, which I thought was kind of funny, like going to someone else's family reunion. He said, come on, man, it'll be fun. Like I have some cousins I want you to meet and no one else will be flirting with them. So it'd be like perfect for you to go and maybe find your next girlfriend. And I was like, you're crazy. And I, I um, <clears throat> kind of embarrassed to say I went and um, it was awkward, uh, but the food was good. And I did go on a couple of dates with a girl, but it didn't work out, which is probably good because you never want to say, hi, I met my wife at a family reunion. So i uh, glad it didn't. <laughs> It did. Glad that it didn't work out uh, after the fact. But Cole and I got to know each other really well, and we came to youth group together every single week. And then one night after small group, Colton came out with his small group leader, Nate, a buddy of mine, and they said, we got some good news. Colton tonight trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I got to hear that and everything, everything seemed to not matter anymore. The drive, whatever, it didn't matter. I could drive twice that much for someone to come to know Jesus. Sometimes it's a sacrifice, but God calls us to come alongside people. And, and it's not just enough to invite someone. Sometimes we got to put that extra mile in by helping them, by meeting them here or picking them up. The third thing that we can do, the last thing in this helping people feel welcome when they come is follow up with those you invite after the event. Follow up. We, we make sure that we write a little letter to a first-time guest, but we also know that it's even more important sometimes for you to follow up. Maybe it's lunch afterwards or it's work or school the next day, but simply saying, hey, what did you think? When we do that, it's cool because we can see how God is working in their lives, how he's maybe speaking and pursuing them. But we also can answer questions and help with any confusion that might have come up. It'll be a way that we can serve actively those people that we love and that we're caring for, that we've de developed relationships with and we've discovered stories and we've discerned a next step by inviting them somewhere. And that is oftentimes what God will ask us to do. Now, God might ask us to do other things, and we find those out how? By growing closer to Jesus. And we do that by investing time in contemplative prayer and these close Christian relationships, and also by leading into him through the struggle. And when we do that, it'll be harder and harder for people around us to go to hell because they'll be able to see Jesus through you and me, and they'll get these invitations to come to know him as Lord and Savior. And we can live all of this out through today's next step, which says, I will pray for the Holy Spirit's discernment for someone who doesn't know Jesus this week. Let us pray. Let us ask the Holy Spirit to guide us to these next steps. Paul said, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Let us have those feet this week. Let us bring this news of victory to the world around us. If you're here today and you are just now hearing this story of victory, or maybe you've heard it before, but you've never given your life over to Jesus, I want to encourage you to make that decision today. It's the best decision that you could ever make. It joins you with God, the God of the universe, in a relationship that will last forever for all eternity. And what it takes to do that is simply A, B, and C. A starts with admitting. We start by admitting who we are and who he is. We admit that we're sinners and that we're not perfect. We don't do everything exactly right, but we also admit that we need Jesus as that rescuer from sin and death. And then we believe, we, we transfer ownership. We believe in Jesus as Lord and owner of our lives and also as our Savior. And then we confess not only our sins, but our need for Jesus. And we commit to living this life not by ourselves, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is a lot better than living by ourselves because the God of the universe will be with us and guide us every step that we take. So right now we're gonna enter into a time of prayer. And whether you're watching online or you're here, and if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'd encourage you to follow along with the prayer with me. I'm gonna pray as if I were you, as if I was trusting in Jesus for the first time today. If you do know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'd encourage you to pray for those in the room or online or in your life that don't yet know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Or if you don't know anyone to pray for, pray that God will bring them to you this week. Would you please pray with me? Dear God, right now, I pray, as I know you will, that you'll hear the prayer of those who wanna join in a relationship with you right now. As we pray, dear God, I believe you are the one true God. And I believe Jesus, your son, came, died, and rose again for me. Jesus, be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Make me new today. And bring me into your family. Holy Spirit, guide me now and forever. 
pray this in Jesus' name. And dear God, for all of us, help us to hear your voice. Help us to get so close to you that it's unmistakable when you're speaking. God, I pray that you'll help us lean into you during the struggles. Bring those close relationships around us that help give us wisdom and give us the the patience and the self-control to invest time in that contemplative prayer with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.